Very good evening to you all. It's lovely to be with you again. And um, just thinking um, as I was putting this message together about when we go out and we're witnessing to people, um, you know, we're here. When we talk to people about heaven and hell, if they believe in heaven and hell, um, we hear all different kinds of responses, different kinds of beliefs. And I remember, I think it was last year when uh, Colin. Uh, and myself, maybe um, Sean and uh, Mimi, we were out in, the, in Dudley Town Centre and I asked a young girl if, um, if she believed in heaven and she said, this is heaven. She said, this is as good as it gets, this is, you know, and uh, she seemed to have a great life and things were going well for her and she says, this is heaven. Um, we also get the other side, don't we, um, when we ask people if they believe in hell. I mean, many times I've heard people say to me, uh, this is hell. And they believe that um, this is as bad as it gets, you know. Um, and you know, some people, it is bad. Um, and I was just looking at the statistics uh, of suicides in our nation, in the UK. Um, last year, 2015, there were actually 3,899 suicides that's an average of just over 10 every day 10 people today somewhere in the UK would have ended their lives probably because they thought that this was as bad as it gets um, is this is as bad as it gets is, is hell a place on earth well I'd like to show three reasons tonight from the scriptures why hell is not a place here on earth and if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And um, we're going to see that this is not a parable. This is a place, a literal place, that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about. Um, and these are literal people as well that we read about. And we're going to read from verse 19 down to verse 31. And we're going to see from these scriptures... Uh, sorry, from these verses tonight, why hell is not a place on earth. And uh, these are the words of the Lord Jesus. He says in verse 19, he says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great goal fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that I may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, father, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. Three reasons why hell is not a place on earth. And the first reason is, is because on earth, the lost often fare sumptuously. But in hell, they don't. Let's just have a look at um, what we see in verse 19. Because we see here that this rich man, he fared sumptuously. It says that there was a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. What does it mean to uh, fare sumptuously? Well, that word fare 
basically means, means to progress. It means to prosper and to succeed. Sumptuously means luxurious, magnificent, grand, costly, expensive, palatial, impressive and imposing. So we see here that this man's richness, we see that he fared sumptuously every day. This man progressed in his riches so much that it was imposing. There are some rich men today, aren't there? You know, we, we think about billionaires. You know, we think about some of these millionaires, uh, these uh, footballers who are earning absolute millions every week. And it's, it's imposing. You think, how can that be? You know, we just can't get our heads around how much that, that some people earn. And it's imposing. Well, this rich man, his riches was imposing. Um, we see that he was rich in money. In verse 19, he says that there was a certain rich man. So he probably had uh, lots of money. We see also that he would have um, prospered in his position and his prestige. The Bible says here that he was clothed in purple and fine linen. And uh, purple in the scriptures often speaks of um, royalty, signifies royalty and priestly garments. Uh, so we see that this man may most likely have had some prestige and a position in society. Uh, we also see here, um, the Bible says that it was unrelenting. It said he fared sumptuously every day. There wasn't a day that went by that this man suffered need. He lacked anything. He had everything that his heart's desire and more uh, could wish. Um, the, the ungodly often fare sumptuously here upon this earth. Let's just have a look at a few scriptures. If you just keep your fingers in uh, Luke 16, we'll be going back there. But Job, he observed um, how the ungodly often prosper in this world. And if you just turn to Job chapter 12, and uh, notice what it says in verse 6. And this is an observation that Job had around him. And um, it says in verse 6, it says, The tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. Um, robbers. You know, I think it was last year, I bought in a brand new bike, and uh, it cost me over £300, and I'd saved up for it for a while. Um, and this bike was beautiful bike I loved it and I just wanted to use it for riding to work on but one morning at seven o'clock uh, some robber came over the fence when we were in bed on a Saturday morning uh, cut the uh, the chain uh, cut the chain on the um, on the on the garden uh, fence uh, the gate and uh, just made off with the bike and um, you know I often think about that bike when I'm riding uh, when I'm driving along and I'm seeing people on the bikes I'm thinking is that my no it's not is that my no it's not but I often think, you know, this, this robber, um, in a way, is prospering right now. Um, in his possessions, you know, he's got something of mine. Uh, I had a motorbike stolen when I was uh, about 22. And uh, I, had, I, I got a, a loan to pay it off. And, I, you know, it took me a, a few years to pay it off. And this was something that I, this bike, that meant a lot to me. Somebody came to my house. Um, I gave him my helmet, I gave him my gloves, I gave him the keys and I said, right, yeah, go on, have a test drive down the road. And that was the last I saw of it. I've got a thousand pounds out there somewhere. It belongs to me, but it's probably in the scrapyard somewhere now. But um, robbers often seem to prosper, you know. The ungodly often prosper here upon this earth. And Job is observing what's going on around him. And uh, if we just turn to, cha uh, to chapter 21 of Job... He says in verse 7, he says, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth, and faileth not. Their cow carveth, 
and casteth not her calf. Verse 11. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp, and rejoice at the sound of the organ. Verse 13. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. But he's observing here how the ungodly often prosper um, in this world. You know, in our nation, in the last few years, we've seen the bankers, haven't we? We've seen the corruption around us in the government. And we've seen how bankers seem to keep their jobs while the economy seems to collapse and the poorer people in our nation seem to pick up the bill for it. But the bankers often seem to just carry on and uh, get more and more wealth, you know. Uh, but one day they will give an account for the way that they have lived. Um, let's just turn to Psalm 73. Let's see how the psalmist um, observed what was going on around him. And you know, often we can get uh, despondent and we can get cast down when we look around us and we see the ungodly prospering in this earth. Um, notice in verse 1, the psalmist says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But he says in verse 2, But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, and they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Verse 9. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. Verse 11. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? You see the arrogancy here of the ungodly. Verse 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. So we see here that not only Job saw it going on, but also the psalmist here. And he saw the prosperity around him. And he was getting downcast about it. And you know that can happen to us. We can think that people are faring a lot better than us. Um, but we shouldn't look like that. You know, we should count our blessings, every blessing that we get. And God has promised that he will provide for our needs. That's wonderful. The ungodly don't have that promise. You know, they can't claim that promise. But we can as God's people. And he's promised that if we'll trust him, put our trust and faith in him, he will supply us our every needs. Not our every wants, necessarily. Our every needs. And uh, he will make sure that we will... Um, have what we need in this life and you know it doesn't seem fair does it when we look around us um, while we see also um, we see the innocent suffering as well you know often we think about uh, health as well you know we think about God's people very often we may know people who are godly Christians who have been uh, laid down with with uh, cancer and all sorts of ailments in their bodies and uh, you know we've been praying for them for, for a long time and uh, the Lord just seems to take them and uh, but then we'll look around us and we'll say well hang on a minute why do, why do they seem to be prospering in their health you know and um, sometimes it doesn't seem fair but that's the world we live in that's the world that, that, that we live in we know that we're going to get new bodies one day. Um, but, you know, we need to get a right perspective, really, upon what's going on around us. And we can only do that when we get our attention in the Scriptures and see it as God sees it. That's, that will encourage us. Um, it doesn't seem fair that the innocent suffer. But as the psalmist in, verse, in uh, chapter 73 sees the end results and um, he starts to see 
what's got to happen in the future to the ungodly. Let's just um, take a read from verse uh, verse 20. Because the end of the lost is not sumptuous, but it's the Bible describes it as slippery. If you just turn to uh, verse 20. Um, no, let's just turn to verse 17. And this psalmist is seeing, observing everything that's going on around him, getting downcast. And then he says in verse 17, he says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. And as a dream when one awakeneth, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. And down to verse 27. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. And we see here that this downcast psalmist saw their prosperity, but now he's seeing and he's understanding their end. Isn't it good that the Bible gives a full perspective upon things you know you know um, rock stars they often boast about having some kind of um, rock and roll party when they go to hell one day they say can you imagine all of the rock singers who have died all the great heavy rockers and you know, all those times that we, that we had listening and to, the, to the music and the, the drugs that we, that we were high on. And, and they seem to think that one day that they're going to have some kind of great rock and roll party in hell. And they boast about it. But the Bible says that something quite different will be their end. Um, I once used to listen to a heavy rock group, which um, one of their songs was Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be. But as we see in our scripture, if we just turn back um, to Luke chapter 16, we see that hell is certainly a bad place to be. <coughs> as this man found out, um, we see here in our reading, if we just look in verse 23... He says, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. And we see that this rich man, like every man, his time comes to leave this life. And he dies. And the Bible says that immediately he goes to this place, hell, and he lifts up his eyes, being in torment. <coughs> and this word torment um, comes from a Greek word, basanos. I don't know if you... Uh, if you knew that, um, if you know what the word basanos means, uh, it has several meanings. Um, it may be where we get our word base from, basanos. Um, but Jesus describes hell four times as a place of torment. We see that in verse 23. We also see it in verse 24. Uh, at the end of verse 24, this rich man says, For I am tormented in this flame. We see in verse 25 at the end, he says, Jesus says, and thou art tormented. And then we see in verse 28 again, he says, they also come into this place of torment. So there was torment in this place. And this word torment, it has four different meanings which describe this word. Um, it has the meaning of going down to the bottom, basanos. Let's just have a look in verse 23. He says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And we see that when this man died, he went down. How do we know that? Well, the Bible says that he looked up, being in torments. You know, the Bible describes, um, if we just turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 14, speaking about Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14. Speaking about Lucifer's end, and um, these were the proud words that uh, Lucifer came out with when he boasted before God. He says, I will ascend above 
the heights of the clouds, verse 14, and I will be like the Most High. And in verse 15 says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So we see here that hell is a place that is down. Some people say, believe that hell is in the centre of this earth. I don't know. But we know from scripture that hell is a place that is going down. It's going down to the bottom. Notice um, a little bit further what he says in verse 19. He says, But thou art cast out of thy grave like an honourable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden underfoot. We know that's talking about the king of Babylon, but it's also having reference to Satan as well. And the Bible says one day that Satan will be cast into hell. He's going to be cast into the lake of fire. And he will go down to the bottom. That's where this rich man went. Um, you know, when we think about going down to the bottom, I don't know if you've ever been into a cave. You know, a dark cave. Well, in 2013, there were 33 men from Chile. Um, don't know if you heard about them. But um, something happened to these miners when they were down in the earth. They were actually about half a mile down in the earth. And um, these men were trapped. 33 men. They were trapped down there. Um, 23,000 feet it was. And all that these men could do was to look up in the darkness. And they must have been crying out for help. Where's this help going to come from? We know eventually that they were rescued. The, a rescue did, team did come and they did send down uh, a, sh um, a shuttle down to, uh, to bring them back up. But they were down there um, for a long time. And when they were down there, they actually wrote a note. I don't know if, um, I know there's one in here that can speak Spanish. But on that note, it said, Estamos bien en el refugio los 33 which means that, in the f that we are okay in this place of refuge, the 33 of us. That's not what this man said in hell. He didn't say, I'm okay. <coughs> the Bible says here that in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Not only does it... Is this word torment described as going to the bottom, but it's also described as acute pain. And in verse 24, we see that this rich man was in acute pain. Um, he said, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And we see here that this is a literal a physical pain that he's suffering. He's suffering it right now, I believe. Um, you know, there was there's a, a famous preacher. We all probably know his name from America. Very uh, famous of uh, doing crusades. And um, this man has often said that he doesn't believe that hell is a literal burning place. Sometimes you'll read in some of his books that he will say that he does, but other times he's made it clear that he doesn't. And I'd just like to quote one thing that this famous evangelist said in 1983 um, about what we're reading here. He says that Jesus used three words to describe hell. The third word that he used is fire. Jesus used this, notice this next word, Jesus used this symbol over and over. This could be literal fire, as many believe, or it could be symbolic. I've often thought that this fire could possibly be, be a burning thirst for God that is never quenched. So we see here that this evangelist, this Christian man, believes that hell, this fire, is only symbolic and it's not literal. Let's just turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. You know there are many a preacher today, even in the pulpit, that will deny 
that hell is a literal place. Um, it's a shame. And many will do it because they might not want to um, discourage the congregation. Maybe they want to bring in more numbers. Maybe they don't want to offend people. Um, but Jesus spoke about hell many times in the scriptures. And one such time is in Mark 9 and uh, verse 45. And um, he says, And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and, their, and the fire is not quenched. So Jesus makes it very clear that this fire is a literal, burning, painful torment that people suffer when they go to that place. And this is what this rich man was experiencing in hell. If this is only symbolic, why would the rich man, why would he want a literal physical finger dipped into physical, physical water to cool his physical tongue from a physical flame. Thirdly, that word torment is also translated or has the meaning of torture as well. And we see that in uh, verse 26. <clears throat> he says, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And we see here that this rich man had the torture of knowing that there was a great gulf fixed between him and his loved ones. Um, you know these Chilean miners that went down, um, they were actually there for 69 days down in this in the, the heart of the earth and um, these miners they didn't know whether they were going to see their relatives again they were stuck down there and they may well have thought and believed that this was the end and that, 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 that separation from their, their loved ones you know and that must have been a terrible thought to have and um, but these miners were rescued and today these miners are free. Actually one of them was um, a, uh, a born again Christian. And he actually wrote um, about the whole story. And it's really interesting to read it if you can get hold of his book. We can give you some details if you want to know his name. But um, you know these miners are free today of that torture, of that separation. And being in that darkness. But this rich man that we're thinking about tonight. He, he, he doesn't have that freedom of being with his family again and um, he suffered that torture of separation and the lost they will stay separated um, hell is not a place on earth because the lost some don't but sorry because the lost because on earth the lost fare sumptuously but in hell they don't secondly on earth the lost still have mercy but in hell, they don't. Let's just have a, a look at verse 26 at the end of there again. Um, Jesus says that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And we see here that this rich man, in verse 24, we see that he cries out for mercy. He says, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy. And we see here that this man realises the separation. He realises where he is. And um, he realises the separation. But he realises that there is no chance of mercy. Mercy is gone. You know the definition of mercy? It's compassion and forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or to harm. And Jesus has that power. And, um, but God is a merciful God. But we see here that scripture makes it clear that after we die, there is no compassion and there is no forgiveness. That's to be sought here in this life. 
Let's just have a look at a few scriptures. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We see here that there is no purgatory. You know, the Catholic Church, over many years, have been making money out of relatives, out of people that have died, and they give a false hope to people that they can, these lost who have died, can have hope of getting out of purgatory and eventually getting into heaven. And it's a lie. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die and after the judgment. After we die, there is no compassion and there is no forgiveness. That's to be sought here, right now, in this life. Um, just turn to Psalm 92. Psalm chapter 92. And um, verse 7. It says that when the wicked spring as the grass, which they often do, and when all the work workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. Psalm 112 and verse 10. Psalm 112 and verse 10. It says, The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And we see here that this man, this rich man, had a desire for mercy. But as it says here, that the desire of the wicked shall perish. I would imagine that this man's desire has perished now. He realises that there is no compassion, there is no forgiveness. It's finished. And um, that's so clear from these scriptures. The lost desire for mercy will perish. Isn't it amazing? I was just speak, saying to Angelica before in the car that it's amazing that how merciful God is. He's a loving and he's a merciful God. But his mercy doesn't reach down to hell to take people out and into heaven. That scripture makes that very clear. But on earth, the lost still have mercy. Um, in verse 25, at the beginning, um, it says here, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime, when you were living, receivest thy good things. And we see here that, we see here the mercy of God's provision. God is a merciful God to us while we are alive right now. It's all around us. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ said, For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. They often fare sumptuously in this life. <coughs> it's the mercy of God. God could just strike an unbeliever down. But often they fare sumptuously. But God is a merciful God. And the Bible says here that his sun rises on the evil and on the good. We also see from scripture that we see in our reading the mercy of scripture. Verse 24 at the beginning. He says that he cried and said, Father Abraham. How did this rich man how did he know Abraham as his father? Well, because he was a Jew. Obviously, he didn't see Abraham, but he knew him from the scriptures. He would have known him from the teachings within the synagogues. Um, and we see in verse 28, um, we see Jesus says, um, in verse 28, speaking about uh, Moses, verse 29, he says, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And we see here that the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that, look, when you were living, you had the mercy of Scripture. You knew about Moses. You knew about the prophets. That would have come from the Scriptures. That's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God that he's left us with the Scriptures today. We know how to get to heaven. And we know how to avoid hell. Because of God's mercy. And he's preserved us with the scriptures. How wonderful. Um, and we also see that there is the mercy of today. 
The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. This is the opportunity. This rich man will never get another opportunity. And people like him in hell today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. If this man had cried for mercy on earth, his prayer would have been answered. It's no good crying out for mercy in hell. It's too late. So we see here that hell is not a place on earth because the lost don't fare sumptuously in hell. They do here on earth, but they don't in hell. And we see also that hell is not a place on earth because the lost have mercy, but in hell it's gone. And thirdly, we see from our reading that hell is not a place on earth because the lost hear the call to repentance but from hell they don't. Let's just have a look in verse 27. Abraham says, these are the words of Jesus, he says, Then he said, at, not that, sorry, the, the rich man, he says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And we see here that this lost man thought that he could get a message to his loved ones from hell via heaven. That's what he was trying to do. Um, but we need to realise that there is no missionary call. There has been no missionary call ever sent from hell. The missionary call comes from earth. Can you imagine if there was, um, can you imagine if um, there was an opportunity for somebody to go from hell, for that, this rich man for example, and if there was an opportunity for him to come back to life and to reach his loved ones, can you imagine the zeal that this loved one would have? Can you, can you imagine the desperation that he would have to see these his loved ones get saved. I'd imagine that today it's like that in hell. There are people in hell today who would love to send a missionary call out. They would love somebody to go from heaven down to this earth and to tell their loved ones not to go to that place that they're in. But we see from the scriptures that a missionary call has never been sent from hell. It's sent from earth. And you know God chooses, he's chosen us. While it's today. To get this message of salvation out. To the lost around us. And especially to our families. I'd imagine that. In our families. That there is somebody. Or some people. Who are still lost. They're still living and we're still living. And we have opportunities every day to be a witness to our families and to, our, uh, and to the lost all around us. Jesus says, go ye into all the world. And he says, preach the gospel. The gospel is not going to come from hell. But it's going to come from you and from me <coughs> upon this earth. How wonderful. Um, notice uh, what Jesus says. Um, in our scripture here in verse 28 he says for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment and you see this lost man is wanting somebody to testify to his loved ones but there is no hope um, of that message getting out from hell. But there is hope today for us to send that message out and to testify to our loved ones, to those who are around us. Um, our loved ones must hear the scriptures. Verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. And then he says, let them hear them. And this is the message that the loved ones, our loved ones need to hear. 
Jesus says, let them hear them. Um, a few months back, I was listening to a radio program and um, this bishop came on the radio and they were actually talking about, is it right to tout your religion in the city centre? You know, which is what we try to do. We try to, you know, proclaim the gospel. Um, but the subject was, is it right to tout your religion? Is it right that people can get up in the middle of the, the town centre and start preaching the gospel? Because many people don't want to hear it. And uh, many people are tired of hearing it. And uh, <clears throat> this radio presenter was putting this out uh, to the listeners. And this bishop came on the radio and uh, he said, talking about preachers, street preachers, he basically said that, you know, when I hear street preachers, I just try to, um, try to evade them. I try to dodge around them. And um, he basically said that um, what people need to, to see is our Christian lives. You know, and he's basically trying to say that they don't need to hear preaching. But the Bible makes it very clear that there is a message that people need to hear. Mm. It's not enough just for people to see us living a clean, holy life. But they need to hear a message. Didn't the Apostle Paul says, say, how should they hear without a preacher? And... I'm not one that I'm not one to go on the radio, you know. I I just but on that day when I heard this this bishop say this, I thought I've got to go on the radio and I've got to try and tell all these people what the Bible says, you know. And I had an opportunity of going on the radio and um, just letting people know that the scripture makes it very clear that there is a message that people need to hear. It's not enough for people just to see us living a clean Christian life. People need to hear the gospel message. It needs to go out. Otherwise, they're not going to hear it. They may know that there is a God by looking at creation, but they're not going to know that there is a Saviour that can save us from our sins without hearing about Jesus from this book. They're not going to hear that looking at the stars. They need to hear it from you, from me. They need to read it in this, in this book, in the Scriptures. I wonder when was the last time that we shared the gospel message with a, a, a lost one? When was the last time that we told somebody about hell? When was the last time that we told some, somebody how to get to heaven? You know, some people will say that we don't need the scriptures. That's just, that's old hat. What we need is we need miracles. If people see miracles, then surely they're going to believe. Well, that's not what we see here in these scriptures. Let's just have a look in verse 30. Um, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But this rich man did, uh, disagreed with that. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. There was a great miracle 2,000 years ago. The Lord Jesus Christ, he did rise from the dead. But you know, for many people, that's not enough. But people need to hear the scriptures. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Um, Hell is not a place on earth tonight. Because from the earth, the lost hear the call to repentance and not hell. This is the day, the Bible says, that the Lord hath made. And we need to get the gospel out. Are we going to do that? Are we going to let God use us as a church, as individuals? To reach the lost all around us. The lost man. The rich man in hell. Forget about him. It's too late. He can't be saved. There is no compassion or forgiveness for this man. But those around us who we see. And come into contact every day. There is still mercy. And there is hope for them. Because God loves them. Every one of them. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. 
Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for just being able to look at this account, this literal account of this rich man that went to hell. We read here tonight, dear Lord, that this man had, has no hope. But Lord, we thank you that there is hope today. We thank you, dear Lord, for those around us, dear Lord, that are still alive. Our friends, those that we work with. And Lord, maybe some of these people are feeling like hell is a place on earth. But Lord, help us to let them know that this is not as bad as it gets without Jesus Christ. We pray, dear Lord, that these people may know and experience the hope that is in Jesus. Help us, we pray, to be your witnesses. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. amen.